I am not Phil DiStefano. Uh, Phil is our wonderful chancellor who's been incredibly supportive of all of our activities here, both on the research and in terms of the new building and in terms of the educational program. Uh, and he really wanted to be here, but it turned out that our basketball team surprised everyone and is now in the final four of the NIT tournament at Madison Square Garden. So of course, you know, if you're the head of a university, you know where your priorities have to lie in a, in a situation like that. So I don't think it was even close. Of course, he is uh, cheering for the, for the basketball team. So what he would have said if uh, he were here is uh, welcome everyone to the University of Colorado campus. Uh, if you come back in a year, we'll be able to host you in our new building, the Jenny Smoley Carruthers Biotechnology Building. We're grateful to the law school for hosting our events in the meantime. Uh, this is an ex incredibly exciting time in science thanks to the astonishing advances in the last 10 years, uh, both in the laboratory and in computer technologies. We're now, we now have an unprecedented and historic opportunity to gain new scientific knowledge and apply that uh, knowledge to human welfare globally. However, this opportunity also brings with it significant challenges, uh, and these are challenges both uh, in the research arena and in undergraduate and graduate education, and those are uh, what we're discussing uh, over this uh, uh, last night and then continuing all day today. And we look forward to your, not, not just your uh, uh, sitting in the audience, but your participation in these discussions. Now, uh, all of us at the University of Colorado are not only your hosts, and, and, our, and, our, and the AAAS is our host too. Thank you, Alan, for, for you and your, and your team for, for supporting this endeavor. But we're also your colleagues uh, in striving to build together uh, the kinds of scientific and educational organizations that will allow us to grasp uh, these opportunities. Uh, before us. And so I anticipate that there will not only be new insights generated here, but also new collaborations uh, in the truest sense of the word. And again, we're delighted and honored to have you here. We look forward to a uniquely productive and exciting meeting. Um, so I'd like to now announce the opening of today's session. The first session of the morning is on planning and funding interdisciplinary research. So it's my great pleasure to introduce uh, my uh, longtime friend and colleague, Carla Schatz, who is director of the BioX program at Stanford University, housed in the Clark Center, which is a really famous uh, uh, interdisciplinary bioscience institute. Uh, Carla is also a professor of biology and neurobiology, renowned for her own work on the development of the mammalian visual system, how the brain is wired, and how brain wiring can go awry in developmental disorders such as autism and schizophrenia. Uh, Dr. Schatz started her career, uh, well, I don't need to give the date, do I? <laughs> no. I'll, 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 there'll be a little redaction here or, or, or reduction or, or something. And also spent time on the faculty of UC Berkeley and Harvard. Uh, where she helped establish Harvard Center for Neurodegeneration and Repair. She returned to Stanford in 2007. She's a member of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences, the National Academy of Science, and the Institute of Medicine. Uh, and it's my pleasure to turn the podium over to Dr. Carla Schatz. Thank you, Phil. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so I, I would like to welcome everybody this morning to this session, and um, I'll tell you more about what BioX is in the next session, although sometimes I say that if I tell you what BioX is, I have to kill you, but I promise I won't do that. Uh, but right now, uh, I, I'm really looking forward to listening and learning. Uh, in fact, uh, I really enjoyed last night, and um, looking forward to today. This is uh, really new to me, and uh, so... I know many of you are very experienced and have thought a lot longer about interdisciplinary research and how to bring uh, frontiers of science together in ways that are effective. And I'm really looking forward to hearing people think about the issues of funding as well, which I'm sure will come up over and over again in the next uh, you know, few uh, sessions. So right now I have uh, my great pleasure to introduce Keith Yamamoto 
who uh, is going to talk about knowledge networks motivating self-assembly of multidisciplinary biomedical research teams. And I'm very happy to say that uh, Keith, is, uh, he's been elevated from uh, Executive Vice Dean to the Vice Chancellor for Research at UC San Francisco. And I know many of you know uh, Keith, uh, if not directly from his uh, groundbreaking <coughs> research um, on hormone receptors, then from his contributions to the textbook Molecular Biology of the Cell. So, Keith. Thanks, Carla. Um, okay. Okay. So, I want to thank the organizers for the opportunity to, to uh, participate in this uh, in this uh, meeting. It's really exciting to see how much energy and activity there is in this uh, realm of uh, interdisciplinary, multidisciplinary uh, research. Uh, all of you are real experts in this, and we've already heard uh, terrific presentations in this regard. A very good discussion last night. Um, and and uh, I don't know if we had a chance to look at the abstracts, I did. Uh, there's a lot, a lot of very exciting stuff there as well. So um, I really uh, appreciate the kind of uh, energy that all of you have put into this uh, realm. Uh, un unlike the other speakers, I'm not going to present uh, a program that is established. I'm not going to present a program that is in an experimental stage. Um, I'm really just going to present an idea and hope to, uh, and hope to get your feedback and generate some uh, discussion about it. This is an idea that emerged while I was uh, serving on a committee that is still uh, relatively early in its activity from the National Academy of Sciences. Um, and this is a, a, a committee to look at a new way to classify uh, human disease, a, a so-called new taxonomy of disease. And in the course of, of uh, sitting on this committee and working uh, uh, with it, um, uh, it suggested to me that, that one way to uh, organize this process of reclassifying human disease was to think about building uh, knowledge networks and that, and that it seemed conceivable that we could construct such networks in ways that would actually motivate the self-assembly uh, of multidisciplinary biomedical research teams or disease research teams. So that's the idea that I'd like to present to you um, and, and I'd love to get your feedback and criticisms and ideas uh, about it and, and, and maybe it'll serve um, a useful purpose for, for the meeting overall. Uh, let me start with this idea, which is that, that disease research is at an inflection point. And by that, what I mean is that, that it, we've had this marvelous run of conceptual and technical advances that have brought us, in my view, to the first uh, really detailed description of uh, how complex disease really is, uh, really daunting, actually. Um, and and that, uh, I think that we are now sitting at this inflection point and that we have an opportunity to, to uh, undergo this, uh, um, uh, again, a very big upswing, uh, if we could come up with something called, that I call here advanced concepts and technologies, whatever that means, um, and that if we are successful in doing this, that it would actually move us from having a detailed description of the complexity of disease to insights about the understanding, treating, and curing of disease. A big move, to be sure. Um, and we're in a situation now where we can collect a lot of data to describe disease, uh, but we're still quite a ways from being able to really understand it. <clears throat> so that's the idea. Now, how do you move through the inflection point? That's the, that's the question. And I think there are two things to think about. One is to expand the scope of the kind of work that we do. A lot of you here, a lot of the programs that we've heard about are doing exactly that, using concepts and technologies, not just drawn from traditional biology, but from, but from physics, chemistry, engineering, math, computer science, social science, in fact. That's one thing. The other is really a need, a burning need, to develop a really working continuum, or functional continuum, more than lip service continuum, um, to, uh, from the basic sciences through the clinical, through the social and behavioral uh, research realm. Um, now, if you think about these two, in a way you could think of them as orthogonal, multidisciplinary research charges, in which um, uh, we move across the sciences to envelop uh, the uh, other concepts to be brought into biology, and we move uh, uh, from uh, the, to the extent from basic fundamental discovery research all the way through the treatment and hopefully cure of patients with, uh, with diseases. 
So that's the challenge, and I think it really, really it allows this notion of, of uh, disease research and inflection point to fit this idea of how we can, uh, we can uh, bridge these gaps. Now, what's, what's what's wrong with the current taxonomy of disease, which I suggest here is actually a barrier to progression through either of those um, uh, uh, challenges. Uh, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's descriptive. Disease classification is currently based predominantly on symptoms and organs and not on mechanisms. It's descriptive. It's static. The current classification system creates rigid silos in research. We have departments of uh, or divisions of cardiology, departments of urology, OBGYN, pediatrics, and so forth. Education, um, we heard a bit about that last night, but I'll just say from, the, from this vantage point, um, uh, in most medical schools in this country, the graduate students and medical students could be trained in different states. They, they, never, they don't see each other, they're not referred to each other, uh, there's no suggestion that there's any relevance that they should be talking to each other, and then when they finish their training, we say, oh great, now we, everybody can collaborate. Um, uh, and and uh, education, and in funding with the NIH, of course, 27 topical institutes uh, that are separated and largely competitive rather than cooperative uh, in some people's views. Um, uh, uh, the current taxonomy is limited. There's no real natural fit for fundamental discovery research uh, in the scheme of, that we've been hearing more and more about of translation. Um, moving toward uh, uh, disease relevance when we know that there are fundamental questions that are outside of that realm that badly need to be asked and answered if we're going to be able to move across the continuum <coughs> and establish a continuum. Uh, it certainly constrains the, exp the expansion of scope or the establishment of that continuum that we're talking about. So there's the problem. Now what if instead we classify disease by mechanism? Um, uh, and, and this makes a certain amount of sense that we, because of what we already know. We already know that one disease state can have multiple distinct molecular underpinnings. Diabetes, of course, is a good example. And listed, listing there a set of mechanistic causes that give rise to diabetes. And we also know that one mechanism can be implicated in more than one disease. S defects in cilia lead to these five, and actually more, but these five very different diseases that seem on their face to be unrelated. And yet, they're all, they have a root cause, or at least major contribution, from defects in producing uh, cilia in the, in the correct fashion. So it means that, this means that we're leaving information on the table, and then a mechanistic classification of disease could potentially capture and use more information for research and education than we're currently using with, with, the, with the taxonomy that we operate with. That's fine, but how do you do it, right? But how would you organize a mechanistic classification of disease? You probably would not, would not want to make a department of cilia. Right? That would be, nothing could be cilia. Um, I'm glad you're all awake. Very good. So I get an extra minute for that. Um, <laughs> um, uh, so you wouldn't want to do that because, in fact, all you'd be doing would be is creating another silo. Uh, and now all the cilia guys would be stuck in some departments and we're working together. Uh, so that's not going to work. So what do we do instead? So maybe, maybe creation of, of networks. Here's a disease gene network. And, and I label it as such in a way to emphasize that it's not really a disease taxonomy. This is a set of genes that are, that are linked together. Each of the nodes is a gene and the edges connect genes that are implicated in the same disease. All right. So there's a disease gene network. It's not a taxonomy of disease in the sense that it doesn't describe disease. It doesn't say that if you have a mutation in this gene, you will get that disease. I mean, almost never is that the case. Uh, so things are much more complicated than that, but it's a start. If you take this diagram and sort of turn it on its edge and simplify uh, it, um, uh, you could end up, you could begin to stack uh, the, uh, this notion of a, a layered set of, uh, of knowledge networks. So the genome, of course, we can move through the ohms. Um, and, and now we stack these things on top of each other as they relate to each other. But, but then, of course, we want to go further than that. Even though we don't really know what the relationships are to other uh, elements that are involved in disease, being able to organize these layered networks in this way, going all the way up to the patient medical record, going all the way to the individual, would be um, a, a useful exercise to kind of have at least the layers of information stacked together. And that the new, the goal would be to build edges between the layers. 
And that could be done by multidisciplinary teams, people that are coming at the problem from different directions with different expertise and so forth. And you begin to build these. Obviously, there's a bunch of links already known between the genome and the proteome and so forth. And you begin to build this information network up and the networks would grow and change as information is added. So, for example, you could begin with this, with, we could begin with this knowledge base, but then through some uh, clever research, see that there's actually a link here as well, and that there's a link between this protein that appears in the proteome and a, a, a member of the microbiome community that hadn't been detected before, but through uh, research uh, that was really directed by the fact that these information networks had been stacked in this way, uh, this information could be discovered. <coughs> So how do you actually use the disease knowledge network? Um, I, I need to caution you to say that, that um, I don't know how to do data visualization, but there are people who are really pros at this. So, this, so it would not look like this because it would be vastly more complicated and this wouldn't work. Um, but there are people that, that do know how to do this. Um, um, all right, because of the pun. Okay, and, and so there'll be accessible information that we tied together, but the key to it is that there will be investigators, names that would also be, we, we tapped on these things. So you could click on a node or an edge and, or sweep out a zone, whoops, sweep out a zone and collect information at the same time to find a potential team of coworkers that are actually working in this area that you, that maybe, that you may know or may not know. So the nodes and edges, then the key is that they're populated with investigators investigator whose work carries them into a new area would immediately see a constellation of colleagues whose work touches in that area. And they could either form or join a team that's already pre-existing. Teams could be designed then in a directed way to uh, be uh, self-assembled with the goal of establishing new nodes or edges within or between layers. So the, what are the incentives then for multidisciplinary teams of this sort? Uh, there would have to be funding, that's, that institutions would have to set aside funds for doing this, so there would be two charges, build the network and set aside funds for these teams. But the goal is that self-assembled teams would, they, would themselves define questions. This would not be orders from the top, but the teams would def themselves define questions as they, as, they, as they see there's relevant people for them to be talking to in the community. They would compete for those resources, whatever is available. Multidisciplinary teams would make novel discoveries that individuals would not. That would be a strong motivation. People would see that their work would actually go better if they operated in these teams. And the dynamics of the teams would be automatic. If the work succeeds, if it advances, then the changes in the needed expertise would drive changes in the team composition. If the work doesn't advance, the team would dissipate and would go on to something else. There would be no overhead costs associated with making a new organization, a new institute, a new department. There aren't any. The teams are just assembled and disassembled as they operate and move forward in, in their scientific progress. So last slide, disease knowledge networks would drive multidisciplinary research. A key thing, they would be enabling and not directive. Um, the team would decide the topic, the approach, the scope of the work. Um, they would uh, self-assemble um, and the project could be as broad and as bold as the team chooses to sweep out an area to see how broadly they can reach their molecular biology to epidemiology or behavioral s uh, science. Uh, the teams would be flexible. Investigators would not be siloed into, into institutes or departments. They would be free to move as their information moves. New knowledge would alter the network pattern. The teams would be dynamic. Composition would change as the research changes. It's scalable. It could be set up as a local institution uh, all the way to uh, multinational. And finally, there would, in principle, have would be an impact on all the stakeholders, the ac academic and private sector scientists, education, uh, there would be real relevant way, reasons for bringing together, for example, medical students and graduate students in training because they'd be operating on this network. Um, funding and regulatory agencies could change the way that they operate in some fundamental ways that would bring people together. And, and, and just public awareness and thought, their views of science in general. I think the public is sort of weary of picking up the paper every morning and seeing that, oh, now forget about PSA tests or, or mammograms. Uh, we were just kidding about telling you that it was absolutely essential for your life in order to do this. Um, and they think that scientists are just tossing coins. And if they saw that they were, we were operating on this network and a change in the network meant that, er, and a change in the advice to the public meant there had actually been progress and we'd actually learn something, it could change the, the public's view and, and policymakers' view of the way that we do our work.
Thanks so much, Keith. Um, it's a really wonderful vision. Um, I'd like to see the face on the chair of cardiology at Stanford when you share it with, <laughs> with him or her. Um, so I think we should just move uh, directly to our next speaker, who is uh, James Gentile. And he's going to talk about Scilog, a method for interdisciplinary proposal design and review. And James uh, has had a career as a scientist in metabolism, mutagenesis, and so on. Morning. Well, you know, following Keith and coming up ahead of Jim, I, I'm just sort of the, you know, the middle of the Oreo cookie here, so I'm going to do my best. Um, Research Corporation for Science Advancement, that's what we do. We're actually the oldest foundation in the United States that funds science, founded in 1912. And uh, I, can, I can say that in the late um, 40s, when Vannevar Bush was the chair of our board, he was called up by the federal government to found other things. And so we're, we're really happy he did that. And we'll, we'll let that suffice. So this is what we do. We really believe uh, we inspire, we support, we innovate, and we advance science. That's our mission. That's our goal. We give away money. Uh, I went there five years ago because it really seemed, after 35 years of looking for money, giving away money seemed like a good gig. And um, it was something that I looked forward to. I consider us to be a venture philanthropy, OK? Philanthro capitalism. We take concepts and techniques from venture capital finance and high technology business management and try to apply them to philanthropic goals and, and, and frameworks. So we take risks. We can take risks because it's our money. Okay, it's not federal money. And, and therefore, we're, we're beholden to ourselves. High risk and high reward is at the national scene. And, and many, many, many people, I could have put any number of individuals with any number of quotes up here, Norm Augustine really comprises it best when he talks about that we really have to drive things through innovative, transformative ideas that have high potential payoff if we're going to move science forward. And I think what Keith just talked about is thinking of ways to actually move medicine forward in, in that very, very high risk way. But we also have to think about where we are as a foundation. I don't know about you, but we took a hit in 2008. All right, and most other organizations did. And so I think of what, what Rutherford said, uh, gentlemen, we have run out of money. It's time to start thinking. Maybe we can say that about the federal government too. Maybe we can say that in a lot of ways about where science is going. So we hire young faculty and we put them out on a point and we say, go forth and innovate and be successful. And by the way, we're going to judge the hell out of you in all sorts of ways. Um, to make sure that, to ensure that you're successful so that you can have a job for some period of time at our institution. And that's how a lot of young faculty feel. I don't know about you, that's how I felt. All right? And I felt that way pretty keenly. Because I feel that science is walls, okay? And Robert Frost said something about that in Mending Walls. Something there is that doesn't love a wall that sends the frozen ground swell under it and spills the upper boulders in the sun and makes gaps even two can pass. Before I build a wall, I'd ask to know what I was walling in or walling out, and to whom I'd like to give offense. Something there is that doesn't love a wall, that wants it down. So maybe, unfortunately, sometimes, not all institutions, but sometimes, academic institutions are liberal bastions of conservative thought. And what we do is we always tend to go for the safe stream, oftentimes, in the decision-making process that occurs. So we have to overcome walls. We have to help that kid that was out on the point crash through those walls in some place if we're going to move interdisciplinarity forward. So we decided to uh, take a risk. We decided to uh, invent a process that was based in part upon a lot of other processes. We call it Scilog. It was really great because when, when um, I have to take credit for coming up with the word, and I looked it up on Google, and the only thing I found was a German company's chemical uh, listing, which was a science log. <laughs> of how you can order chemicals from them. So I think of this rather as a integration of science and dialogue, science and community. And um, there's a lot of things that are going on in this diagram. I, won't, I think you can just take a look. If you explore and listen and learn and brainstorm and design and innovate and reach out and you bring partners in, you can get collaboration to occur if you mix the right stew together. The objective is to focus funding on early career scientists. I'll, I'll address that in a moment. Enable high-risk research that might fall outside of the boundaries of other, of other forms of funding. 
establish and convene interdisciplinary communities of researchers, and leverage funding to further support successful lines of research. It's an experiment. So we target early career faculty, and we heard something yesterday, I forget what the age was, between 35 and 40 are our most innovative years. Mine was probably between 12 and 15. But uh, for, the, for the most part, we, we look for a sweet spot, and we look for the, in this silog process, we look for the associate professors. And we do that because we recognize high risk, high return research that's going to involve collaborations, puts you at risk. And while we all of our other programs tend to fund in that area, this one program we decided we wanted them to have tenure. We wanted them to have a secure position so that they would feel more comfortable taking risk and moving forward. We've got a track record of doing this and a track record that's successful. So why focus on recently tenured faculty? They're creative, original, transformative research usually occurs at that point of a person's career. A small early career investment can have a much larger impact than on a similar grant later on. They've been vetted by departments, established labs, they've got a record of accomplishment, they can take risks, and they're hungry dogs. And that's a compliment. They're looking for that next great adventure. So we focused on a theme, all right? Because we felt that it would be easier to identify transformative ideas by focusing on a subject area that would limit our scope of the kinds of things that came in. We vetted about 150 proposals. We received 78 full, full proposals. Uh, we held a meeting of all the award winners. We impaneled a 10-person review panel that Nate, um, Nate Lewis from Caltech shared for us. We funded 13 proposals at about $250,000 each. We're a small foundation. We do the best we can. So why don't we only fund 13? Well, actually, we, we put the rest of the money back in our pocket because our review panel said the other proposals were very, very, very good, but they were not transformative or innovative. So we stuck very tightly to some guidelines that we, we tended to use to look for the possibility of this really being breakthrough research. So the awardees, I won't go through this, but when, when you get the uh, slides later, you can get a sense it's from a, from a variety of different um, institutions. But we come to a conference, and we hold it at Biosphere 2, all right? Because I wanted those folks to, A, be able to be in an isolated atmosphere a la a Gordon conference. B, I wanted them to be in a nice atmosphere. And you can see there's some pretty, pretty good place that God bless Columbia University for putting up unused dormitories that um, uh, they then abandoned. And, and so we gladly fill with research scientists for our meetings. And I wanted them to stand there, look at Biosphere, and see one of the girl, world's greatest risks that didn't work. And then understand that almost everything that we began to know about carbon dioxide effects on coral reefs came out of the fact that it didn't work when the ocean and biosphere started dying and they started to do the research. So you can get an awful, awful lot of understanding out of failed experiments if you open your mind and think about where they go. And besides, I wanted it to be surrounded by rattlesnakes so that they stayed there. <laughs> Worked pretty well. So we brought in mentors, and this, this is just a particular group of men, mentors that we worked with because we thought senior scientists who, who are really role models for being able to take risks in their life and move, move some things forward would be good conveners and good interactors and good mentors for, the, for these faculty. We brought in Liz McCormick. Um, Liz, Liz uh, is from Bryn Mawr, and she's very good at, at helping us to form and frame a controlled dialogue. Um, we gave challenge grants to the groups when, once they got there, and, and and the challenge grants were $100,000 each. Um, they responded well. The feedback was very good. I was part of a, overheard several aha conversations. They wanted more focused dialogue rather than just random dialogue among themselves. They wanted the competition for supplemental funding. That was a good thing to do. They helped each other write the proposals that they were competing with each other to get. Interesting observation. Um, they said, not so sure, it feels like an experiment. Well, they're, they're smart. It was an experiment. And they thought a key was incremental steps in funding, moving it along. Um, complex diagram, all I'm going to say is that if you take a look at it, a lot of lines were formed. It went, it went from individuals really in the first column not knowing one another and making connections to all of a sudden collaboration starting to form among the awardees. I'm happy to ship you a paper that's been written on this so you can get the data. Matter of fact, I'll, I'll give it to Melanie and she can distribute it in some way, shape, or form because I heard the bell telling me I've only got about 30 seconds left. Um, and I want to get to the bottom line. 
The bottom line, I believe, for funding agencies is not only to fund what's innovative, but we have to find ways of forming unique partnerships. No one ever thought of seeing Jerry and Albert sitting on the same bench together. All right? Um, I'm an old deadhead, and I love Einstein quotes, and I love Einstein science, and so I can see that marriage. But we have to help others to be able to see that marriage. We have to have others to be able to move forward. We're running an experiment. We are putting now a second round of funding into Scilog solar energy conversion, and we're getting a bumper crop of a response of folks who want to buy in. The next part of the experiment, how do you take a community now that's been formed for a year in a variety of ways that we keep it going, and we add new players to that community? That's an experiment that we really need to do and we needed to look at and we need to assess. The bump grants are important. How do we bring the National Science Foundation solar teams from the chemistry division in and to help them meld in because they've got some wonderful coordinative teams. We're funding engineers, physicists, chemists, optical scientists, and some biologists. Those are the kinds of teams that are coming together, together to, to address this. So um, stay tuned. We're going to let you know whether the experiment works. We think that it's a model that can work for any subject area, not just solar energy, and that might have some adaptability in various ways of, of bringing interdisciplinarity across uh, boundaries. So thank you. Thanks, Jim. I, I'm wondering what tune they're playing together. Oh, it's got to be trucking. <laughs> got to be trucking. So uh, let's uh, move on. And now Jim Collins is going to uh, talk to us about funding research at the borders of disciplines. He's the Virginia Ullman Professor of Natural History and the Environment at Ar Arizona State University. And uh, uh, he works on host pathogen biology and decline of species. So Jim. Thank you. Jim, right? <laughs> James, if you're my mother. Um, thanks very much. It's a real pleasure to be here. I think you're going to hear a common theme that's going to be this notion of forming distinctive partnerships, potentially even using individuals that have not even met each other before as we go through this presentation as well. Here's a claim by David Baltimore. I don't think it's going to be entirely true. We're not going to see the disappearance of all the disciplines as we go ahead from here. But what we're in the midst of, it seems to me, as we think about this interdisciplinary science, interdisciplinary research problem is something like the following. You have disciplines, you can pick chemistry, you can pick biology, you can pick mathematics. Individuals want to work together, you can call this multidisciplinary. At some point, they make an even different, a more complete commitment, that becomes interdisciplinary. And at the end of the day, you may finally have a department of biochemistry that's a transdisciplinary creation. You run this process again using biology, using the social sciences, using engineering, kick it around, and you come out at the other end with a school of sustainability science. We find ourselves in the midst of this dynamic right now, and the challenge, it seems to me, is that it's turning faster and faster and faster, and we're trying as a combination of research scientists and administrators to sort of catch this lightning in a bottle and do something with it at any particular time. So the challenge is sustaining disciplines, it seems to me, while blurring the boundaries because we're trying to drive this innovation engine. Now I say sustain the disciplines while blurring the boundaries, and I make this point in this particular editorial here by focus on, focusing on science and engineering unlimited by borders. It doesn't mean that you don't have borders, you need them at some point, but the challenge is when you get to the edge of them, what happens at that particular junction? At the heart of this challenge, it seems to me, is what we'll call the process of discovery. It's this notion of an innovation ecosystem, and you're going to test ideas with one or a few individuals. Increasingly, we're finding evidence that this testing is being done by groups of individuals and even larger and larger groups of individuals. So in this letter to, to Nature, predicting protein structure, a couple of things are critical. Multiplayers, online game, six senior scientists and the folded players. A group of scientists, but also amateurs, all who work together and solve this protein problem folding, protein folding problem, which is not a trivial problem. So in this process of discovery right now, innovation really is not an idea. It is just a process that we're going to keep going along. It's not just an idea, rather. It is this process. And it's something we have to move into the curriculum and the research labs 
And what I'm going to say then is that students really, in which they learn, the way in which they learn is also changing. You can look at Twitter, Facebook. They are learning in the social network driven processes. So what I see at this particular start of the 21st century is the convergence of these two big cultural forces. One of which is influencing each, and they're both influencing each other. One is the formal process of discovery, and this other is this informal process of social network learning. And they're kind of crashing together. And part of what you heard in the first two talks is them coming together and sort of struggling with how do we do this. In 2007, EPSRC, Engineering and Physical Sciences Research Council of, the Nationals of, um, of Great Britain, contacted NSF, specifically bio, and said, what are you doing relative to transformative research? And we said, we hadn't thought about it yet, although we had to because the board just came out with this report. They said, we've got this ideas factory, and we've been using this process called the sand pit. It's an intensive, interacting five-day process to generate ideas. Remember, in the sandbox on this particular side of the Atlantic. But the idea is this transformative novel ideas, a real wow factor. We had an open call for a competition within synthetic biology. The application was just two pages. Front page, what's your best idea? Back page, a series of questions prepared by an occupational psychologist. How well do you play in groups, et cetera, et cetera. This went to a panel of three individuals. We had 170 applications. They identified 30 individuals, many of whom did not even know each other, brought them outside Washington, DC, put them together for a week with $10 million on the table. Facilitators run this process for the week, and it goes through a very quick process where you interact and get out to ideas and fund projects, $10 million worth of projects at the end of five days. The process works first day. Here's what I do, here's what's needed. Lots and lots of sticky notes. Day two is really a disorientation session. It's getting people out of their comfort zones, asking where do you want to be, and asking the really tough questions. Three and four, it's an iterative process. Lots and lots of sticky notes go up, striving to find out where the middle ground is. And on day five, you're funding five groups of five to six individuals with $10 million on the table because they generated these good ideas all by themselves over that five-day process. I want to argue that that sort of on-site social network that you build is another example of what is a prediction market, where it's an exchange that tries to forecast the future. And you can move beyond corporate applications right now to poll communities of practitioners in order to see where the science is at any particular time. So Dave Rajewski at the Wilson Center is running this experiment now with a prediction market in synthetic biology. Here are the kinds of questions that can be posed. How many genes, proteins are going to be included? What's the structure of this first self-assembling and replicating organism? And when is this going to happen? So you can use this prediction market to get a sense of where the community is at and where you might want to fund or not fund, depending upon what the answers are that you get into this process. Since the days of the Medici's, we've used prizes in order to motivate processes of discovery. And indeed, that's being discussed right now in lots and lots of different ways in terms of how prizes can also be used to motivate bringing groups together and or just individual investigators. So the antithesis of this sort of argument is the individual investigator, right? The primacy, and we'll call that the Martin Arrowsmith model where there is great strength and a lot to be done from single investigators, this process does not mean you toss this out. It means that it augments it. There is this networking process that can augment what's going on at the individual investigator level as far as problem solving is concerned. So let me conclude. Problem solving within social networks, I'll argue, is increasingly common feature and it's one that we can use fruitfully to both decide about funding and conduct interdisciplinary research. Can we assess which approaches to answering the question might be pursued most productively? You can run a prediction market. How can we identify and sharpen our questions while assessing the best methods? The sand pit would seem to be a nice way to go about that sort of process. Are there ways to answer complex novel questions, maybe without even gathering new data? NSF has been funding synthesis centers for 15 years, and the whole notion of crowdsourcing, using the wisdom of the crowd, is another way of coming together even without brand new data. You use what's already extant. How do we reward? What sort of reward structure is going to be the best in terms of performance? 
That opens up the whole area of prizes and how do we motivate not only individuals, but groups. And then here is the $64,000 question for this afternoon. What is training supposed to look like if this, in fact, is the environment that we're seeing just at the edge of this research and training environment? I would argue that if you focus on the process of discovery itself, then you can motivate individuals from there. So I'll leave you now with two questions. One, how are researchers, educators, administrators using these or other non-traditional methods right now? And what can we learn from that? And when should we be using these sorts of methods in order to facilitate interdisciplinary research? And the last question I'll leave you with as I end is this one. Do these processes and procedures, in fact, represent what in the language of Clayton Christensen and the business community we can call disruptive technologies? That is, there's the individual investigator mode of working on things, and then there is this sort of multi-investigator, social network, potentially driven way of doing things. And to what extent does that represent the edge of what we can all remember, some people based on the phenotypes in the room can remember, was initially a 15-inch floppy disk, went to a five and a half inch floppy disk or five and a quarter inch. I loaded this up with a thumb drive this morning and in two years we'll load it up with cloud computing. That's the notion of disruptive technologies and to what degree are these kinds of multi-investigators, social network driven things, disruptive technologies that are sitting on the edge of our universe and how are they going to be incorporated or not be incorporated? I'll come back to this this afternoon. Thanks very much. Jim, thank you very much for that provocative talk. I guess I could ask uh, whether the individual investigator is going to become an endangered species. We can talk about that later. Um, so now uh, we have, uh, we're going to begin to have some time for real discussion. And uh, in fact, to, to launch us is Bob Tejan, who uh, is, is uh, president of the Howard Hughes Medical Institute and uh, professor, oh, time's up, um, <laughs> and uh, uh, professor of uh, biochemistry and molecular biology at UC Berkeley and uh, a good friend and colleague, actually. So, Bob, uh, I think start and we'll just take it away. Great. Darla, thanks. So, you know, the theme this morning was really uh, figuring out the planning of interdisciplinary research modes, and you heard three very interesting and provocative ones, but of course we all know that we can't really herd cats without money. So the question is how do you motivate, and actually I have, I'm not going to stand here and give a talk, but rather maybe sort of instigate you, the audience, to start thinking about the challenges of what you just heard from the three presenters, because in each of them they have a really nice idea. But the question is, how do you sustain that? Uh, you know, you can give it VC, you know, initial funding, but a lot of these projects might take 10, 20 years before you see the product. Uh, and especially if you're talking about, you know, disease uh, and integrating all that information that Keith talked about, that's a huge challenge. And the organizations that are now charged with doing the research, the universities and so forth, really have no mechanism to support this. And so the key for many of us is trying to figure out not only how do we do the initial seed funding, which is easy, but how do you then keep it going? And keep it going in a way that continues to be, quote, transformative, that is, that it keeps changing. I think that's a fundamental pressure that I see. Uh, because in the end, you know, funders have to decide what the metric is that says I should keep giving you more money. This is, the, this is my job, and Tom had my job before me. The, what I spend most of my time thinking about and trying to understand is how do I decide of the, you know, almost infinite number of ideas out there, which ones I'm going to put my bet on. And yes, some organizations have the capacity, uh, as Jim Gentile said, to uh, not be constrained uh, to take risks. And uh, we all hope to be able to do that. But it's a calculated risk. 
And it's risk that you're going to then evaluate very, very quickly to see whether the risk was worth taking. So I think that's a, a, a real challenge. And I, I invite uh, the three speakers to come back up here because what I really want to do is open it up for questions by the audience, which I think the whole point of this meeting is not for a bunch of us to sit up here and talk, but to, to communicate. So please join us up here, and Carla, you can also help. And I don't know if people have already started uh, put writing questions in, um, but in fact, I would really prefer to just have hands up, get the microphone, and uh, let's have a dialogue. I have lots of other questions, but I really want to give the audience uh, a chance to start okay. pinging. Yeah, well, Tom. I, I, would, I would like to follow up on Hugh's comment, because I was thinking the, the funding here is, is different in, in biomedical research or some other areas of science than it is in, in, in a lot of these sort of social network solvable problems. Yeah. And I was thinking particularly when Keith was talking, you know, that there are some analogies to your, to your knowledge networks that work extremely well. And Wikipedia comes to mind and Ancestry.com. Believe it or not. So, you know, you can, anybody in the world can log in, they can click on somebody who's their ancestor, they get all of this information, they can add to it, they can get uh, uh, records of, of that person's birth and death and immigration and, and et cetera. And, and it's self correcting and it doesn't, and it doesn't matter if, if there are mistakes in it because they go away, right, and you can ignore them. So, so you're, you're so Keith was sort of saying this should work for, for, for disease, but it seems to me that in these successful cases, there's a very low entry to bar low, low barrier to entry, and it's not expensive. It doesn't take very long. You have some relatively accessible information you can add to the system. You can get it. You can get it back out. The difference, as Keith was sort of you know, alluding to in biomedical research is that a lot of these ideas take a huge amount of time to test and they're expensive to, you know, it's not, um, you could have a social network where people would say, oh, just run a clinical trial on this particular idea. Yeah, well, <laughs> 10 years and half a billion dollars later, you would know whether that was a good idea. So, so, um, how do we reconcile the, how do we bridge the gap from the cases where, where the social networking really has been remarkably robust and powerful and exciting to these, for example, disease problems where, where it just doesn't seem to, work doesn't seem to uh, go at the right pace to, to really allow this system to work to its maximum potential. Did, did, uh did all of you guys in the back here, is it possible? Great. Great. We're good. Is that a question for me? Yeah. I, well, I think I, you, you start. Actually, I think yeah. it sort of cuts yeah. across. I, I mean, it cuts across Jim's talk, too, and I, I think both Jim's. And I'm not sure that I understand what you, you were raising as the issue. Is it that the pace of being able to define success is, is much slower than in the social networks that we're used to? Um, and therefore, how are you going to be able to create a sustainable force uh, behind it? Is that well, how do you fund right. the, the people who are going to, coming back to teach from, how does a funder fund, you know, the, the people who are going to, um, put, to going to make the connections on your knowledge network? And the answer might be the, the research corporation model, where you, where you do a, Silo. Yeah, it's a great name, isn't it? It doesn't roll off my tongue. No, right. no. Uh, it's Italian. Yeah, yeah. Silo. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Tom's from Iowa, so he can't really. He can't yeah, you're from Iowa, too. Yeah, so well, okay. Don't rub it in. <laughs> well, uh, can I, yeah, right. well, I think one kind of answer, Tom, is that, and it may seem a little hackly, it would be wrong to assume that any one of these kinds of approaches is going to be the answer. And so when we think about this notion of an innovation ecosystem, you can lay it out the way I did, focusing on these social networks, or you can think about it more broadly across the innovation ecosystem that represents the United States of America. And the key, it seems to me, under those circumstances is to have groups such as the National Science Board, such as Congress, 
being able to step back and say, all right, what does the innovation ecosystem look like across the United States, and what kinds of things can we get out of these different kinds of approaches, some of which may take really long-term funding, some of which may take long-term funding, but you want to keep people's feet to the fire. So there's something I didn't talk about, which is called micro-philanthropy that's happening right now. Individuals coming out of the business community, they're accustomed to that sort of culture, so they'll give you $200,000 to get an idea started, but it's like a DARPA model. Come back in six months and let me know what you've done. And you kind of spin that way. So the key, it seems to me, is to not get locked into any one. And this is the challenge, as I'll come back to this afternoon, of leadership right now, is to how do you pick and choose among this emerging smorgasbord of possibilities at any particular time, depending upon where you see your institution and or your program, in that diagram I put up, the multicolored one, where things are turning so quickly. So Tom, I, I sort of see your question broken down into two parts. Because one thing that I got out of Keith's uh, discussion is that if you have these different layers that you want to try to integrate people, I think the interesting part of his diagram was, you know, if you could click on to some edge of that diagram, you, you get a set of people. Now, so the question is, how, who decides who those people are? Okay. In other words, how did Keith get to the point of assigning the right people to be on that, in that matrix? I think that can be done. I mean, we're mm -hmm. pretty good at that. Mm -hmm. That doesn't require a lot of funding to do that. It just requires information that has to be integrated. That, that part, I think, can be done with a relatively small funding. But then, the next step that you're addressing, I think, is really a challenge. Because even if you then get the right sector of people that say, hey, we're all going to get together and figure out how cilia really works for these diseases. That's a $10 million a year project. Okay, then the question is, where are you going to get that? And I would argue that one part of the problem is that large universities and uh, research universities haven't really figured out that they need to have funding kind of put in, committed without knowing what the projects are going to be to allow this to, to, to flourish. Well, I, I'll, I'll talk about uh, something like that when I describe let, later. Let me, let me just really quick, because it, I, I think you're exactly right. And, and um, I, I, I had the opportunity uh, not terribly long ago to sit with Secretary Chu, and he called together a couple of private foundations, um, some businesses, I'll, I'll leave them unnamed, unnamed, a couple of university uh, um, leaders. Um, He's representing DOE and a bunch of venture capitalists. And we sat down at Slack, and we were in the room for about four hours asking that very thing. So maybe there are new consortiums of money that need to come together that are atypical, um, that really need to come in and find this amalgam and, and, and find a way to get that $10 million bolus um, you know, for the best innovative ideas and the integrative portion. So, so I think that's one thing that I like to pitch out to the crowd to think about is that maybe the funding streams, as wonderfully generous as they all are, as represented by, by those of us at the table and those of you sitting there, aren't enough. And we're missing some links. I went to a meeting recently in, in, in uh, Green Tech. There were 1,500 venture capitalists at that meeting and a heck of a lot of money. And they are very interested in where some of this stuff can go. But what's going to happen, obviously, if you get VCs involved in the university community going forward. And so, um, and you can't keep that quiet because it's just like we're going to the cloud. It's, it's going to evolve. And so we have to start looking more expansively at how, how to get that back up for source. I actually think the problem is not as big as you think. That, yeah, I think this is, it really, I said scalable in my talk, and I, and I, yeah. and I believe that it, that it is. That institutions do have research money. Uh, they make uh, decisions about how they're going to roll that money out into new programs or existing programs. Um, and, and I would hope that they would look at this as an experiment that they could try. And, they'll, and different institutions with different amounts of risk aversion will put different some amounts of money in. I'm looking at Steve Beckwith, who's a vice president for research for the University of California. So. Uh, so take good notes, Steve. So, 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 um, uh, so I, I can imagine an institution saying, "Let's take a million dollars, right? Even if it is a ten million dollar idea, and just say to the community, we would love to get you, you guys, to come together in some sort of innovative team that tries to take on a challenge that none of you could take on by yourselves. That that maybe if we had built the network and they and they extract 
the team from that, the self-built, self-assembled self -assembled team from that, they could tell us how, how bold they were in drawing, that, in, in drawing out that loop uh, that would see how many uh, people that they would uh, uh, encompass. Uh, some of the people would be the people they collaborate with every day. Some of the people, they wouldn't even know their names. They would be in departments they would think they would never interact with. Um, uh, and, and, and so forth. So this could be done on an institutional level, or we, we all know that the NIH puts together some big programs. We heard com some concerns about that last night. Um, uh, they make decisions, um, millions of dollars per program, and they could say to the community again, uh, if they wanted to, they could channel it into a particular area of interest. I would hope they wouldn't, but they might, uh, because, in, because a given institute may, may fund the, the, the program. Um, but if it came out of the common fund, the NIH could just say, let's see some teams that would come together in new ways that would take on challenges that right now are not accessible to any one of the, uh, the group and just see what happens. It would be particularly interesting if the evaluations would, would get made uh, in some uh, innovative uh, way itself. Some, the Sandpit idea that, that uh, Jim presented is one, where the actual applicants are actually involved in maturing the ideas and making them better and moving on from there. So I think there are ways to do this uh, at scale, uh, as an experiment, uh, it is one, and, and, we'll, and I think relatively quickly we could begin to see whether these things begin to bear fruit, and, and if so, it will build enthusiasm. So I, I have a bunch of thoughts, too, but I think as, as moderator, I should call, I know Alan Leshner had his hand up, I, and there's someone over there, so at least two questions, if they're, uh, please try to keep them short rather than making long comments. <laughs> and then I see some people in the back and their questions up on the board. So. So, so there's a cultural issue that has to get attacked before we can get the big funders to participate. I think it's inexcusable that NIH or NSF wouldn't be able to find an easy way to do this. But I can tell you from my own experience, every time you say we want to build science and technology centers, so I was actually the first director of that program at NSF. I am 22 years old. I look like this because of that experience. <laughs> On the National Science Board, we tried to get NSF to do transformative research. Unless the community, the advisors, and the peer reviewers are going to support the leadership of the agencies, they're not going to do it. But there has to be a way to make that cultural change. If you have any good ideas, uh, they would be highly welcome. Well, I, no, I think that, in my experience, trying to get well-established federal or even state organizations to, to pony up this uh, high-risk project to begin with is, uh, is, is a non-starter, in my view. I think the best successes have been, uh, as some of you have already mentioned, to go to the private sector where these people are used to risk-taking and have been successful at it. And Many of them, uh, there's kind of a new breed of philanthropists who are a lot younger than, than the previous generation. They want to see their money do the work while they're still alive. And they can understand this concept, or any of the concepts that we talked about, doesn't matter what field, whether it's energy or food sources or biomedicine, they get it. And I think that that's where I see a lot of the, quote, seed funding is going to come from, or even intermediate funding. However, I don't think any of them are ready to, you know, put $500 million a year into this, even if they have it. So somehow you have to then go through that transition. So you got to convince them first, but maybe they can help convince the big organizations like NIH and NSF. Yeah. Uh, so I'd like to jump in there, too, because this is definitely a problem that I've been thinking about a lot. And I really agree with Tej that uh, a lot of this is going to have to come early, early stage, before you would even approach NSF or NIH right. from private foundations and uh, I think, or private, you know, investors in a way. And I think the issue is that many, even at that level, many uh, of these inspired people who are willing to invest money um, are already thinking about a uh, translation or an application. And while this is great, I think we still have the problem of fundamental innovation and discovery that may come from really 
creative team-based approach that, because it's high risk, actually nobody wants to invest in except very sophisticated people and universities that understand the nature of discovery. And I actually really worry, essentially, about the, um, the, the pipeline, the very beginning, the flow from the high mountain stream. And where is that flow? How are we going to sustain that flow? Because we're so interested in translation. So this is not an answer to the question. It's really another question. I don't really see that source of, of support. Um, there's somebody very patiently waiting there. And then, Barbara, I see your hand up. And I know I probably have some blind spots on the right. So. <coughs> Hi, my name is Holly Falk Krasinski, and I'm with Research Team Support and Development at Northwestern and president of the National Organization of Research Development Professionals. So I posted on the, the list uh, a comprehensive listing of interdisciplinary research funding opportunities that, that NORDUP has pulled together. The issue isn't about, to me, finding the initial amount of money. In fact, I think there's a great deal, many opportunities for funding interdisciplinary research in its first five years. The problem comes after five years. So I'd love to hear your thoughts on what guidance we can give the funding agencies about providing sustainable interdisciplinary research funding, not just about starting it up. Because the problem is these really highly effective interdisciplinary teams get to the end of five years, and they're told it's a non-renewable opportunity. And so they have to then move backwards and start splitting things up into silos and getting everything funded itty bitty piecemeal all over again and it seems to have wasted the efforts of the first five years and that kind of intense funding. So really appreciate your thoughts because that's where we're finding the most difficulty. So uh, I'll, I'll take a real quick shot at that and it's not, not a solution but one of our one of our approaches is, is again uh, we I have to take a look at limited resources um, and, and, and how we distribute and, and exact problem you can't teach is it, you sit there and you go, wow, I have this palette of excellent ideas, but I can only invest in a, in a fraction of them. So one of the things that uh, uh, we do is we, we look for other private philanthropy that wants to come in, other private foundations. So we have constant conversations going on with other foundations, private foundations that fund science. So we're proving our mettle, we hope, in what's going on to help that next stage, not the forever stage but that next stage, what happens after that five-year period? And are there ways one could expand that based on, on, on some of the opportunities? So I think, I think foundations actually have the responsibility to be advocates um, for what's going on and, and help to find the funding as well as just kick it off and kind of move it in those kinds of directions. That's one approach. It's not the longer-term approach, but it's at least looking at what I would call the equivalent of the valley of death. Um, if you were in a venture capitalist world, but that's the valley of death in the scientific academic community world. What do you do after that first five years? Uh, well, part Barbara? Of it, oh, sorry. So go ahead. Let's keep going on this. So yeah. part of it is going to be where, where these institutions feel they're at in that, pro, in that churn between the disciplines at the bottom and, and going to some transdisciplinary opportunity at the top. You can, you can venture getting these interdisciplinary things going and then there may be organizations with a mission like Jim's or a mission like the NSF. It's hard to make that translation. There's no doubt about it. But on the other hand, that sometimes it becomes easier because the community is ready to move from uh, just uh, ecology and engineering and mathematics to sustainability. So the institution creates something that's called a division of sustainability. Then your interdisciplinary team get, can get funded within that. And it depends on where you're at in that whole spectrum that's going to depend on whether or not you can capture the long-term funding other than cobbling together something like venture capitalists and that sort of thing. Barbara. Thanks. Um, uh, I don't much like Wall Street metaphors, but um, portfolio is what comes to mind listening to this. And what uh, I found especially challenging is getting the risk uh, portfolio and the style portfolio to have lots of granularity. And so whether you're a funder or a university executor, this thing about how to get a part that's really high risk in which you reward yourself for failure. You say, okay, 
you know, I'm looking for one-third success because you cannot high, everybody wants the high risk, high gain without any failure. And without that's, of risk. course, absurd. And, but you've got to have the will to set it aside and get the agreement of everybody on board so that, for example, you don't get a group of reviewers in a room who say, yeah, yeah, we hear you, and then apply the usual standards. And getting that granularity and somehow keeping it through the process and then getting it dynamic for the sustainability thing, I think is, I, I don't have a solution for it, but some of it has to be sort of systematized in setting the expectations. So I'd really like to see people discuss this and audience. I'd like to have you participate as well in this specific uh, issue, which I think is really at the heart of a lot of these matters. So uh, I, let me respond to that a little bit. I don't know if it's an answer, Barbara, but um, I think that, that certainly an essential component of uh, being able to succeed in maintaining um, a program that seeks um, uh, really transformative uh, ideas and supports them uh, is, is a group of uh, generalist thinkers who um, uh, recognize a good idea and are willing to maintain these very high standards. Uh, I don't know that we, we've achieved that at UCSF, but I'll tell you, I'll tell you about a, a fund that we have there that uh, has been sustainable. It's, now, it's just finishing its 14th year. Uh, it's called the Program for Breakthrough Biomedical Research. It is funded at a level of about $6 million a year that goes into the local community, uh, that, and which we, I've chaired the committee for 13 of 14 years. So I haven't gotten any money <laughs> um, from it. Um, uh, and and um, basically the standard is uh, send us stuff that the NIH would laugh out of the room. Um, and anything that fits on, in the NIH uh, portfolio, we, we can't look at because the $6 million is about 1% of the research money at UCSF. So if you had 1% that was funded in, and evaluated in the same way as the NIH money, then tripling it would make no difference and, and zeroing it out would make no difference. But instead, that, that $6 million is viewed as the most valuable research money in the institution, uh, very highly competed for. Um, and we've had, we've been lucky to have faculty committees, it's been a big turnover, but it's faculty committees that are willing to maintain that standard on ourselves uh, all the way through. And I think that's the only way that you can have something that will be sustainable is that you set the standard and you just don't give, you just won't give, you don't give. Yeah, you don't, you don't. Um, and, and, uh, and that's an essential component. Yeah, a comment there, and then Jim. I'm sorry, is this on <laughs> the topic of, I think there are a few more questions here that are on the topic that we're just discussing. I, I won't forget you, I promise. Is it a change? <laughs> okay. <laughs> well. Go ahead, Jim. Yeah, why don't so, you finish? So I, you, I, it's a great point, uh, and your phrase "reward yourself a failure" is, is just the right one. So, um, in in where good ideas come from, Stephen Johnson argues that in, in fact the real challenge, as far as research is concerned, is is accelerating the rate of failure. Mm -hmm. uh, you really need to go through these fail things fast. and find out fail what fast. what does fail faster and fail faster. Um, Jim's right as far as Biosphere 2 is concerned. There were some things that came out of the aquatic experiment. The other thing that clearly came out in a, in a lovely paper in, in science was the notion of being able to create these artificial communities that were going to be self-sustaining. It's, you know, really, really hard to do. Right. And so we've got this system outside Biosphere 2 that works pretty well. It means we ought to work really, really hard to keep that thing intact and working because Given our own devices, we can't do a very good job of creating that thing from nothing. So you can learn a lot from, uh, from failure. It seems the trick is to not buy into the idea, as my colleague Ed Hackett mentioned last night, that you can pick an individual research project and decide it's going to be transformative. You just can't do that. So what you have to do and what researchers like him tell us is you can create institutions with structures that are more likely to yield transformative 
results after X amount of time. And so the trick is creating that institution and recognizing that you need a department of really, really risky stuff where if they're not failing on a pretty good rate, then the evaluation for that leader that year is not going to be very good because the individual is not taking enough risk. And that's the kind of mentality, it seems, has to get inculcated in our institutions, uh, rewarded. And go back to Alan's point, it has to be part of the culture to make it work. But, but by the way, there, there's two, uh, I'd like to say that there's two elements of trust that are crucial to this process as well. One is that the, the, uh, the institution has to trust the group that's making the judgments because they're picking things that are failing. Right, and so we all agree that if unless you pick things that are failing, you're not shooting high enough. But of course, if you pick only things that are failing, it's not so <laughs> impressive. Over the top, <laughs> right? And and so finding that balance point is very hard, and it's it, and that's an element of the very difficult um, uh, thing of being able to judge, establish metrics, to judge things that are out of the norm. You can't use normative metrics to judge things that are out of the norm because you end up with normative things. Um, and the other element of trust, of course, is trusting the investigators. And, and that's why I like long-term funding because it really says to the investigator, you know, this will take 10 years and so here's 10 years of money and just tell us every year that you're still an investigator and we're happy. Um, and maybe at year eight something will really happen. Um, and, and so I think that, that those two elements of trust are also indelible um, elements of the process. A real, real, quick, a real quick comment on that. I, I don't want you to forget the social networking that's going to be involved. Because in our, in our situation, I think we're predicting actually um, under the table, um, coming out for the first time here, that we probably aren't going to see the real transformative ideas come for maybe two generations of collaborations that are going to come out of this. And there's going to be a lot of spurs, some of which are going to fail, some of which are going to have some really unique and exciting stuff. But actually, it, it may be different iterations of collaborations. And so some way to keep that conversation going, keep the sample alive, keep the silo going, keep that funding through a collaboration within the university community that's doing it, I think is an essential element. It softens the failure in a lot of ways. And it, and it helps that failure actually be many successes, or at least it, compile into this additive hole that's going to go on. And so um, I, I, I really want to underscore, I think the collaborative dialogue component is really important, whether it be on a campus or whether it be national in some way. Let's go back to the audience for a little while. So I, I, I want to make sure I understand the threads. I think there's a risk thread and a collaborative thread, and I, I see those as separate. So let me just make a comment on, on each one. Just for one minute, can everyone hear? Over in the corner can you, there? Can you get the microphone? No. Maybe you could stand up or we could get a microphone. So on the, on the risk side, I, uh, in a previous life I um, ran the Hubble Space Telescope. And since I assigned all the time, I had the capability of performing some of these experiments. And one experiment we performed was exactly this. That is, we were worried that it was the most competitive facility in astrophysics, probably still is. And so the proposals tended to be very conservative, and the peer review tended to be very conservative as well. And we saw this as a problem because, you know, this is exactly the sort of thing at the cutting edge that we wanted to see some high-risk stuff. So we instituted a program of high-risk, a separate category, compared separate, you know, reviewed by a separate peer review group. And what we found is we actually got relatively few proposals. And the main problem was because most of the research is done at universities, and the, the risk is not seen so much as a risk of getting telescope time, but whether they're going to be rewarded for their efforts on campus. And so I think coming back to a theme from last night, working on the campus risk reward systems is going to be critical. You know, the great industrial labs are by and large look on. Most of the, most of the research in many fields, certainly in the physical sciences, maybe also in biology, shifted to universities. So the university culture is going to be critical as to whether or not we get those. So that's the risk side. On the collaborative side, um, I, I saw this both in astrophysics and also I see this very currently in the University of California. We do uh, fund uh, collaborative efforts in some fields. Have to, they almost have to to solve the problems, and so they're figuring it out. And I find that the young people have, have this down. I mean, it's, it's a change of culture from my generation, and it's very clear. I've gone to a bunch of conferences that we funded just for collaboration. I've watched the way they interact. It's a completely different mindset than it was when I was a young professor. 
And so I think the young people kind of get it. But once again, I think if the reward structures within the universities are not there, this will, this will die. If the reward structures are there, I think this will drive the funding agencies. I think for the most part, the big revolutions, you know, we come, we say nano, bio, info is the sort of thing. That was driven by revolutions in the field. It wasn't driven by the funding agencies. The NSF didn't suddenly discover that nanoscience was the thing to do. They're followers, largely. So if we can reward the young people, they're going to find out those new areas, and they will ultimately drive the funding agencies to get money into it. They'll drive guys like you as well. And I think that's so, th I think we do have a lot of work to do on campuses, just the sort of thing that Keith was talking about. So, um, Steve, that you're Steve, is that correct? Steve Beckwith, yeah, yes. Yeah, thanks. I mean, is that your question up there, or did someone else, it's like 1A, identifying members of interdisciplinary teams is important. Uh, question is how to create the right environment, success and failure. Does any, was, did, is there someone in the audience who wrote that who would like to also make a comment about it now or qu add to it? They're gone, okay. There's <laughs> um, a question in the back over there. Yeah, in, uh, way patient, way in the back. Great, thank you. So I wonder if the part of the solution to both the sustainability and, and the creation of the collaborative spirit can be, can be ingrained in the traditional funding sources. Say R01, the most traditional uh, funding source in the biomedical research. Uh, Keith and others have shown that you can transform how these grants are written and reviewed, yet to this day we do not have a category as an applicant or as a reviewer to judge the collaborative spirit of that PI or that team. There is significance, impact, investigator, uh, innovation uh, and environment. No words on how many collaborations that PI has established. Um, there's no way of scoring it. Ten papers in high impact journals within the silo count as much or the same as ten papers that have three collaborators each. Mm -hmm. So why not have uh, NSF, NIH and others have a separate uh, category of, uh, metric where we can just do an interactum of the PI. How many collaborators you have? What fraction of your publications are collaborative? Those grants get, get reviewed every five years. You know, if every five years I'm going to be asked to show how many new collaborations I establish, well, that reward for that behavior, that's going to make it sustainable and also it's going to create the need for the, uh, for the transdisciplinary approach. Just you, a thought. You know, I, I think it's a terrific uh, suggestion that can be implemented soon, and I hope there are people here in the audience, and I see several writing things down, who will really consider this seriously. I would also say that, uh, in fact, it's a negative in many ways to collaborate, particularly if you happen to be uh, one of the ones facilitating a collaboration and putting yourself in the middle of a long authorship. And I cannot tell you how often I've heard and I've had the experience myself of being, of being told that I didn't do that work because someone else was a senior author. It's completely absurd. But worse, it really, it, really, uh, it really works against this very process that we've been talking about today. Uh, okay, there's another hand way in the back there that was up a few times. Hi, thank you. I'm Russ Porter from Harvard University. I had a question sort of synthesizing this discussion today and even reflecting on Tom's graph last night about the incentives for collaboration. Um, we've tried through a variety of funding mechanisms to fund high-risk research on campus. Carlo, you were even involved in some of those ventures with us before you left. And we've had some success and funds have dried up and come back in the university and right now we're in more constrained times. And I'm wondering about the sustainability on campus and thinking about if the fundamental problem is still the core, how we, how we retain and attract faculty in the, in the sense in that we give them pots of cash when they start, they're under their control for their lab, we give them space that's sometimes shared but for the most part still their space. And if anyone in the room has anything to say about sort of the foundation of how we retain and recruit faculty and how it plays into this dynamic. I'm sure there are a lot of thoughts here. Does anyone want to comment? Well, at, at, um, at Arizona State, when, when we started to go down this road of highly collaborative um, interdisciplinary work in the early 90s, when I was chair of biology, it's, it's a cultural issue. It comes back to something that Alan Lushner said, and you need to just start within the department. So um, in the big universities, it seems to me you have to get the heart and soul of the department chairs. At the, at the smaller colleges, you have to get the heart and soul of the dean. But you just have to work with the faculty members 
and point to them to the advantages and what happens when you do this sort of thing. It doesn't mean that you throw out individual investigators. It means that you're going to build in a whole other piece of the program and demonstrate to them that there is great value in that. Now, this notion of looking at the publication record and seeing how many collaborative papers there are then in a young person applying to the program is one kind of metric that you use. And, and then I knew that as chair that I had really managed to get over a big hurdle when sitting in a, in a review meeting for a new person coming in, an older colleague who was committed to individual investigator stuff, um, a name came on the table and somebody said, this person looks pretty good. And he said, I don't think he has enough collaborative multi-author papers. I'm not sure he'll fit into the department right now. Now, at that point, you know you've kind of gone through the looking glass and come out the other side with at least some people that are willing to really think this through and are seeing things a little bit differently with you. But you've really got, you've got, to, you've got to get down on the ground with it. It's not going to happen magically. It's not going to happen overnight. Uh, yeah. Jim, Just very also. quick from a, 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 my lobotomy from being a former dean is coming back a little bit. But we used to, be, but I, um, I was at a smaller liberal arts college, you know, one of the nifty 50. And uh, one of the things about that is, is it demands collaboration. If you're in Holland, Michigan, and you are, you are perhaps one of two people in genetics, and you have ideas that you want to vet, you have to vet it within the confines of a 76 person faculty. Or you have to have collaborations that take you far and wide across the world, which are fine and do that. So we tended to select for people that understood that and had a bit of overlap. And so the recruit was the most important aspect of it. And then the retain became easier and moving it forward. And, and so I'm taking that now just to let you know to Research Corporation. And we're evolving a, prob a, a program directly to fund folks to do that to be able to fund internal collaborations. We're going to work with the PUIs in this particular program, but it works just as well with the R1s, to say we're going to help you establish that internal environment that will, will, will make that culture work. So, uh, Teach, and then it looks like there are a lot of, of comments from the audience. Made. Obviously, what you probably heard from Tom last night, that that was the whole point of Geneva Farms. That's right. Was that we were going to put roughly 12% of all of our funding uh, capacity into an experiment, I would say. It's still an ongoing experiment to do just that, yep. where uh, you're not particularly assigned a specific set of space. Uh, there's a lot of shared facilities. You know, you're, you're, you have a small lab because you, you want to be collaborative. So right. You can't run a huge lab. Those are almost <laughs> incompatible. Um, on the other hand, there is a tension there because at the same time, they have to be judged by outside uh, judges who want to go by the standard of, you know, how many X papers are you the senior author of and so on and so forth. So I don't know what the solution is going to be because you can't operate in a, in, in, in a vacuum because some of these uh, young investigators that we're supporting are going to have to go out and, and, you know, probably get jobs at the universities that are still going by the other standard. So uh, how to change that culture in universities is a huge That's job. Huge. Uh, the young faculty definitely get it, and they're coming around, but they're not in a, power of, uh, in a position of power to make those decisions yet. And the question wow. is, by the time they get to have the power to make the decisions, will they make those decisions? Because they, by then, they may have already switched. <laughs> So that's the problem. It, so, no, I was just going to say, we're, we're doing everything we can to break the spirit of the very people that can pull this off. And, I mean, when I say we're, I'm talking about the community at large. Uh, so David, and then uh, who are some of the other people? Just let's go way, 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 way in the back, and then we'll come forward a few. And that's, so we'll have like four more comments on this theme here.
completely blindly uh, at that time, going to take up mass spectrometry for uh, the world, okay? uh, which at that time was not yet popular. And uh, the other sort of accreted around that, and we got turned down by people who uh, saw that they were going to run the teacher's problem. Well, what's very interesting now, four of these people have come up for tenure. All of them uh, got through tenure with no uh, problem. Uh, they did not have a lot of first author papers, but the uh, success of the ensemble, for example, uh, you know, uh, was so obvious uh, that uh, they all profited. And now I don't, I no longer have this thing. So I want very strongly to support the idea that uh, the terms that we would do to bring people in, at least the young faculty, uh, is, is critical. If you don't, if you, and, and of course, I had the support of Princeton higher up that we were going to do this. They knew that that was what the plan was. And so uh, we, uh, it, it can be done. That's what I, I wanted to say. But it has to be very explicit. I, I can, can we make a uh, Sure, let's have a response and then. <laughs> so I, I just want to we point out. We have time, out, we have a little more time, don't worry. I just want to point out that, that as powerful as David is, he's not all of Princeton. And, and, <laughs> and so this says that, that you, can, you don't actually have to turn a whole institution at the same time. That's right. uh, and you can carry out an experiment within an institution that's willing in the way that Princeton was and is to carry out such an experiment and show that it's successful and begin to develop a little pod community within the greater community that is operating actually in a different way. Um, and others see that and it begins to grow. And I would, I would actually argue that there are such pods around the country now that exist. There are places for people that are training in, in David's unit at Princeton to go other places in the country. So it's not that there's, that there's nothing. And I think that it's really important that we maintain that and don't capitulate to the system as it stands because uh, otherwise our people, won't be, our people won't be able to find jobs. I think that we need to stand on uh, this new way of operating because it's essential. And, I, and the essential word is, is for real. I think that we actually won't, you know, I talked about disease, I think we actually won't understand disease unless we can, unless we can begin to operate in this new mode of working together in new ways, of working across fields. Um, and, and so it actually won't work unless we do that. Uh, the places that recognize that and begin to respond and hire and teach uh, accordingly are, are going to be noticed because they will rise to the top because they're, they're the ones that will begin to be able to show success. Okay, way in the back with the microphone. Yeah, uh, uh, Ron Gill, University of Colorado uh, in the other city. Uh, my question has to do with especially the young trainees, and this has come up and it's important to me. Uh, I direct a, tr a, a transplantation research center, and the whole philosophy is, I mean, we're here because we believe in this whole interdisciplinary communal kind of thing. And my concern is uh, how we, pr given the risk curve from last night, how we actually protect the advancement of these junior people. We're, we're asking them to do communal work, higher risk, which, it, which makes them more vulnerable. And I also just recently chaired an NI study section, and, and what you often hear in these kind of people is, well, they're in this this group of this emperor-driven environment. So they, they completely reverse the criteria. And so how do we know that person is valid? So how, I realize there's probably not a good answer for that, but how do we, those who are directing and trying to promote that very kind of environment, promote the development and uh, uh, div just promotion of these junior people? I guess I can try to touch on that because, so this has been, uh, you know, I'm being obsessed with this problem because we're going to have to evaluate all the people that were hired at JFRC. They've had a very different environment to work in than, uh, let's say, our typical Hughes investigators. And in fact, I think Tom will remember that when he started JFRC, we probably got the, the greatest negatives from our own investigators <laughs> who thought, why are you spending money on that project when you should be giving me more money? So, so, that, so that becomes a real issue. and and. You know, you're you're touching on a really important thing. Uh, is it does it mean that we ought to evaluate these people by a different standard, or do we have to change the whole way of thinking about evaluation? And and we decided that it's the latter. We we have to come up with a procedure where it will be clear to all of the Hughes investigators that we're actually judging all of them, including all the JFRC group leaders and fellows, by the same criterion. But we have to define what that's going to be. And that is a very difficult thing to do if you're trying to move the needle too far. 
So my guess is you're going to have to move the needle incrementally in that direction. And that's a, that's a very, very tough thing to do. Have we got time? Uh, well, actually, we have a few. Would you mind, Jim? I'll no, come back. Ahead, so go. we have uh, one burning question right over here. Oh. Okay, good. Let's take the microphone. Wait, get, get the mic. I was just going to give an example because I'm hearing some comments saying some, a lot of the change needs to happen in the institutions. Uh, so I was Dean of Engineering at ASU the past four years. And what we did was start with our vision, which is leading uh, engineering discovery and innovative uh, education for global impact on quality of life. And then to accomplish our vision, we uh, had to actually change the whole structure of our engineering school. And so we're changing our whole way of thinking as to what kind of impact can we make on society. So we got rid of our 10 or 11 departments and we actually created five schools based on Grand Challenge themes. So for example, we have a school of biological and health systems engineering, another one on sus sustainable engineering in the built environment and, and so on. So other ones on energy and there are other uh, Grand Challenge areas. Security is another one. And that's actually just really enabled so many different things, the interdisciplinary research and the education. Uh, it was difficult to do at first because faculty thought they were going to lose their identity, uh, but it turns out they didn't. There's still a professor of electrical engineering or a professor of mechanical engineering. We still have the same degree programs. We also are starting to offer new ones, uh, and we can just do so much more across the different disciplines where we're focusing on what, are we, what kind of impact are we going to make and what kind of problems are we going to solve. The students love it, donors love it, industry loves it. Uh, so it's just an example of how we can do things and make a change uh, at the institution. We also have support from the president in terms of a evaluation of our faculty uh, for promotion and tenure cases. Uh, he's actually even turned over some cases earlier on in terms of saying, well, they were doing interdisciplinary research. They should be rewarded for that. And then Tom mentioned something yesterday about hiring not into a particular department. We don't hire into a department. We don't have departments. We actually are recruiting faculty that want to be part of some team working on some large scale problem. Uh, and some faculty said, oh, you'll never get anyone that wants to come and be a faculty member here. Well, we've been recruiting fantastic faculty. <coughs> and, and it goes on. So that was just an example that I think addressed some of the points that were brought up here. So, so uh, if you have, if you want to learn more about this exciting uh, process, Definitely, we have time in our break and so on for this. Um, let's see. Yeah, you, I think you had your hand up in the middle there, sort of toward the front. And please remember to identify yourself. Hi, my name, my name is Tom P. Huda, um, University of Nevada, Las Vegas, Associate Vice President for Interdisciplinary Research. I wanted to uh, maybe expand out the discussion on the evaluation and maybe to the when you, when you provide the seed money to these different teams, I guess on the, on the back end of it, I'd be interested in the panel's um, perspectives on how do you evaluate whether that was a successful investment? You know, I've heard about failure in here too and how that's evaluated in there, but how do you evaluate the impact of that? Um, of, because I think many, many universities are starting to go down this path in terms of seeding efforts, but they need to critically look and see what's the real impact of that and was it successful or not. So well, in our program, um, we did an evaluation of 10 years, 10, year, 10, 10 years into the program. And uh, we were quite concerned about the point that I raised earlier of just using conventional metrics to assess the success. Um, and, uh, but we nevertheless did do that as, and, 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 and added uh, a qualitative assessment on that I'll tell you about. So, and, and so we uh, looked at uh, the number of follow-on grant dollars uh, that came out, the number of, uh, so uh, papers have been published, patents, companies started, and so forth. And, and the leveraging was really remarkable. We had, at, that, at the tenure mark, we've invested $42 million into the community of this kind of money. Um, and it had turned into over $300 million in follow-on grants, over 200 uh, NIH uh, R01 grants, uh, over 900 paper, papers published, 60 patents uh, applied for, granted, 
Um, I can't remember how many companies, but a handful of companies. Um, and so all of that looked very good to the people that we, many of the people that we were trying to persuade to give, to give money to the program, many of whom were quite conscious of this leveraging concept. Um, uh, but what was actually more striking to me and more valuable uh, was that we asked the, uh, the grantees and actually some people who didn't get funded in the program just to write a paragraph or a page uh, about how this, this money affected uh, their work, um, uh, the impacts that it had. Um, and and uh, this included projects that actually f failed. Um, and and uh, it was really remarkable, the comment, commentaries we got back. We got pa pages from some people. Uh, we, got, we got comments from two people who were not funded, who said, basically said the same thing. They said, just being able to finally write down what I really think would be a cool thing to do was great. So, so I'm going to try to answer that question in my talk, too, when I talk about BioX. But I think I want to go back to something uh, Barbara Wald said earlier, which is maybe to remember that the program should be assessed at large, not individual successes or failures. It's really the portfolio. Because, you know, it's like, I think, venture capital in a way. And this is really intellectual capital that we're all investing in, and it's high risk. So there'll be a lot of failures, but there'll be a few successes that make the whole package look incredibly strong. And in a way, that that's yeah. probably is the success. S uh, certainly a key is going to be, um, Joe Hamelsman likes to say, and I say this about education, is, is you have to have an idea about what you want the students to know at the end of the course, right? What are the concepts, what are the principles, what are the theories that you are, are, are going to judge them by at the end? And so I find often institutions go into these interdisciplinary activities with no sense really of what they'd like to have come out at the end. Why are we structuring it in this particular way? There is, in fact, a, a, a whole body of literature, sets of theories that have to do with what works and what doesn't work in terms of what you're likely to get out at the end. And I find very few places start there. They just sort of think, if we can put these individuals together, then good things are going to happen. And sometimes that happens. But there are other ways to do it in which you can be a much more creative and much more deliberate in terms of institution building. Yeah, I'll, I'll just add very quickly, to, just to build on that, um, there's an organization many of you know about. It's called Project Kaleidoscope. And it's an educational initiative that really talks about building communities of learners. And I think a lot of the principles that that one looks at as to how the let's let's just make that now building a community of scholars, and what does that really mean, and what are the frameworks of the community, and that gets back into the networking and everything else, and 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 I think those are going to provide some measures, but it's a long-term measure. It's not going to be five years. What do we have? It's going to be 20 years from now. What do we have? So one uh, last question from the audience. Um, uh, Victoria Hamilton, Columbia University. Victoria Hamilton, Columbia University. Um, uh, where my title, which captures the ambiguity and total lack of authority I enjoy, is uh, Research Initiatives Coordinator. Um, but we do run a program similar to yours where, where we put a little bit of seed money into interdisciplinary opportunities. We get over 100 applications, and unfortunately we can only do four or five. And I'm sitting here thinking, oh my god, we've been assessing it on a normative way. And we, uh, uh, do you ever... In order to, to go into the venture capital model again, successful venture communities treat failures like, um, like dueling scars. And unsuccessful venture community, I mean, people, co communities who try and start, and it doesn't, it's, it's a source of shame that you fail. So I'm thinking, gee, we never actually look at our failures and see why they failed, which might actually teach us something. Do you ever, in, in your tenure, did you look at the failures and see why they failed? Is it different than regular, I mean, sometimes failure because it wasn't a very good pick, but sometimes they might be more noble failures, and if so, what were the criteria you used to, to assess them? Uh, criteria, so we did look at the, fail, the, at the way that things failed, um, and, and as you predict, many of those things turned into other observations that were fruitful, uh, but, but in fact, the idea failed. And, and usually it was because uh, the idea was just wrong, that, that uh, they come forward with a really bold initiative or bold idea that the committee was very attracted to, that thought that there would be a broad impact if it was correct, uh, and it was not. So they were able to disprove the idea in many of the cases. 
Uh, other ones, they write a technical problems that just that they couldn't uh, get through and other things of that sort that were a little bit less interesting. But m most of the ones that were interesting were ideas that failed. And almost, almost in every case, as you'd expect from with investigators that would come forth with ideas like that, they were able, because they were observant, they were able to find other directions to go that were, were fruitful, but didn't have quite the punch that the original idea had. Very quick. So, I'm sorry, well, very okay, last, quick. Very quick. Remember, we funded three catalytic ramp-up grants. Um, of those that didn't get it, um, three other teams formed de novo. So I, I want to thank the audience for all of these good questions and our speakers for really provocative and uh, inspiring talks. And I know we have to be back at 10.30, is that correct? OK, 10.29, I'm told, we have to be back. and I. <laughs> and I think um, I think we could we could leave with the concept that actually failure is good, and we should think of better ways to reward ourselves for fail, failure. <laughs> yeah. 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 Don't yeah. fail to come back on time. Thank you. was amazing. Got through all your slides. And you actually I was going to. It was great. It was really a really great activity. I'll, I'll build on it this afternoon.